Welcome to episode 101 of Let's Talk Geek, recorded 11 July 2012. In the show, we're talking about Ouya, the $99 Android game console that promises to be hacker and gamer friendly. We're also chatting to Toby Korean, an Android developer in South Africa, and looking at his Blue Moat app as well as his other apps. And last but not least, Pluto has a fifth moon. Who knew? Thanks for watching. Welcome to the show. In the show today, we have... I'm Gerrit Vermeulen. And Gerrit, where can people find you? They can find me at, a, uh, find me at about.me slash hockeyza. Great. And what do you do? Um, I am the tech support. Okay, cool. I'm Jan Vermeulen. I am your acting host for the show and a staff writer at my broadband. We also have... Tim Hawk. Uh, you can find me online. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and joining us as a guest in this show today is Toby Kurin. Yes. Am I saying it right? Korean, yes. Korean. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, welcome to the show, Toby. Uh, tell us, tell us a bit about yourself. Um, what do you do? All right, so I basically, uh, a lot of people know me as an Android developer. I'm an Android freelance developer, but I do a lot of other stuff. I, I, I'm like building projects at House for Hack and doing talks and being a panelist at conferences and stuff like that. So just basically a lot of cool stuff. All right, yeah. cool. Well, um, if you're not in IRC already and you are watching the live stream of the show, you can join us in IRC to ask all kinds of inappropriate questions of us. Um, IRC.ltnet.tv, typing that into a browser won't work. If you don't know how to work an IRC client, then go days. to uh, our live page while viewing this and just click on the chat buttons. There's a couple um, yep. so that you can choose from and that'll launch Mibit and then you'll be in our chat room. And uh, Remember to pick a nickname. Um, <laughs> yeah, and if you do have a client, irc.ltnet, channel hash ltnet. Yep, and the port is 6667, uh, normal IRC mm. standard fare. The random for the show is that Pythagoras may or may not have killed a guy for ruining his simplest ratio theory. And uh, the simplest ratio theory is basically that you can take any uh, ratio of Pythagorean triples. Um, you, you can simplify it until one of them is odd. You, so basically divide by two, divide by two, divide by two until, both, until one of them is odd, and then that's the simplest ratio. And so a guy said, okay, but hang on. If I can show that this isn't true for one triangle, you know, that, that means that your theory is wrong. Yep. So what about a triangle with two unit, unit size, sides? So triangle with uh, one side one and one side one. So for those of you who don't remember the, the theory of Pythagoras, the way that you calculate the, the length of the hypotenuse is by squaring the two sides, adding them together, and then taking the square root of the result. And then that gives you that, the hypotenuse, <coughs> which in this so case is square root two, two, right? Which is definitely not an odd number. In fact, it's not even a rational number, <laughs> right? So it's a... <laughs> it's a rational number? It's an no. irrational number. Square root of two. Oh, yes. Sorry, yeah. sorry. I'm getting... So I'm thinking imaginary. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, yes. it's, it's definitely <laughs> real. It doesn't get, it, it's, yes, it's, it's real. It's definitely real. <laughs> it but exists, it's, but it's just not rational. Yeah. And 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 so uh, and so Pythagoras apparently killed the guy. <laughs> For ruin, he's like, you have ruined the simplicity that is my theory. Die. <laughs> How true that is, we don't know. Yes, but go watch Vihart. Um, she she put together a, a neat little video of. Uh, uh, of Pythagoras and, and like all the lore surrounding him. And she what puts fun videos together about maths. She's always awesome with her videos. Yeah, yes. she actually, she, for, if you don't think math is fun, watch Vihart mm. and she will make you think that math is fun. And if she can't do it, no, no one, one can. can. Yeah. Absolutely. And so a couple of events coming up. Um, and I'm not going to run through them all because we, we, we seem to run through a lot of the same events week in and week out. Check out startates.co.za. While we've got Toby in the show, you can check out his app, SA Events, and yeah. we'll talk about that a bit later. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, the, for, for some cool dates of events coming up. And then one thing we haven't mentioned before is that there's something really cool coming up. And you spotted this, Gerrit. Um, yeah, I, I think it just popped up in one of my streams. It's called H+. It's a digital series. Uh, as far as I know, they're going to be publishing through something like YouTube or it's online. Um, and it looks really, really cool. It's High production values. This is not just some indie project. Well, some indie project. I mean, indies are cool, but yeah. this is Warner Brothers. Yeah. And this looks uh, from the, the trailer is out. So go watch the trailer. And it looks really really high quality. It's going to be short or like half an hour length or... Because um, I know there's like the Dragon yeah, I'm, I'm Age actually not sure. Felice Day, which was quite good. It came out recently. Yeah, I watched a few episodes of that. Can't, can't say I watched the whole thing. Mm. Um, so yeah, the, the premise this of this is interesting. If you've read the, I think the Jump 
two two one th- series. I, I don't remember the exact name, but mm. a, a book called Infoquake and its sequel, Multi Real, and then it's got like it's a trilogy. Okay. Um, and it's sort of in that same vein, you know. Basically, if if all the world is connected, but through your body, they actually implant the a method to connect to the internet in your body. Cool. What can go wrong? All right, so... Uh, yeah, but what could go right? <laughs> <laughs> a lot could go right. But what if some, some things started going wrong? And How much control do these, these implants have over your body? Not much. Wow. <laughs> well, well, that's, that's kind of where this is going, where H plus is going. So it is very looking at social networking, but if it starts going to cyborg, to the area of cyborgs. Cool. Kind of like Caprica type of thing. Yeah, uh, like yeah, the, the initial precept of Caprica, exactly, mm. uh, which kind of evolved. V-World. Yeah, exactly, which mm. kind of evolved from that. I mean, V-World just became a, uh, a sort of plot element to, to drive yeah. the rest of the whole immortality yeah. plot line. Something else I remember we just also need to mention, Rage is coming. Yes, <laughs> again, I, uh, I mean... Just more book your tickets, like, be ready, yes. finger on the button, one hour. Make sure you watch the, the, the twit face and the, and the press for when those tickets go on sale because they sell out in hours. And that's the reason why we're mentioning it again. Yes, yes. All right, so uh, that, I think it's time to go into our topics. Yep. Cool. So first up is uh, the, the sensationalist headline of the day, which is... Thunderbird is dead. Oh, no. <laughs> but it's well, actually not. not. Fail headline. <laughs> yes. Um, well, actually, the, the thing that Mozilla sent out was correct. And everybody, you know, the press jumped on it and went, oh, no, Thunderbird is dead, which is not correct. What they're saying is they're stopping development on Thunderbird, Mozilla, the Mozilla team. Act, uh, feature development. Feature development. They're still going to be doing security development. So what I'm, I'm actually, I'm speculating now, is they're putting that development team and putting them on something like Firefox OS, um, whatever that's actually going to be called. So they're, they're shifting their resources to something that they think is a lot more important. But let's get real for a second, right? If Mozilla is no longer developing features for Thunderbird, it's pretty much dead. I well, mean, it, it's okay. a fairly well, slow project I, I, to begin with. For you. Which, bra- which male client has had new features recently? Well, <laughs> Outlook changes every, <laughs> every two years. Yeah, but what actually changes? Yeah, the layouts and stuff. Yeah, and what new features? Well, well does also, get? Thunderbird's got the whole plugin system, yeah, right? They've and had a decent plugin system for a while. I used to use Thunderbird while. and Lightning, very, very frightening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, and that yeah, worked as, really yeah, well. Yeah, exactly. So as and and while it's stable and while it's running, people can always write plugins for additional features. And but that's been a problem for Firefox is that they've been iterating so quickly with Firefox. They release a new build, suddenly all of your plugins break. People go, why are my plugins broken? And now that now it's up to the developers to try mm. and you know, fix exactly. the plugins for this this really quick new version where um, Thunderbird, they've been going fairly slowly. But do they really need to add more stuff well, when they have this really good plugin system? Well, that's my question. Is, is a lot of these things, you're, you're, most of your development is happening with online mail, so the Google apps yeah, and all the and rest of it. Yeah, and that's also what they've been saying is webmail has been doing its its job, stuff like Gmail. I mean, I can and honestly I say, say I'm using Gmail now instead of uh, a dedicated desktop mail client. And that's where a lot, of the dev- a lot of the inspiration, I think, has come for desktop clients to improve on. So, for example, proper threaded conversation yeah. uh, views and... Um, and they've done that in Thunderbird. Yeah, yeah, hmm. ex- uh, finally. Yeah. yeah. It, um, and, uh, yeah, so that, that works. D- does, it, does it thread your sent replies together with the original? Yeah, I think, that, yeah I think so. That's one of the things that, that, that wasn't working initially, plans. but I think I, I, I had to use a plugin, and since then I've had been able to get rid of the plugin. And I think now it works. Also, However, where you need to turn the view on yes. to, for it to do that. It doesn't always do it by uh, I, I haven't used it in a while, but in, in my experience, I was always a little frustrated with it. It's, it's like Google's thing was able to just figure out a little bit better when something was part of a conversation or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, and not to say that Google is perfect, because in the beginning of Gmail, they also were just randomly... <laughs> Um, like in a really long uh, mailing list thread, all of a sudden we just randomly start a new thread for the same topic. Well, look, you must also say with Google that they've got a lot more information to, to fix it. Mm. With Thunderbird, they're sort of working off what people are telling them. Um, and I think that's also why there's a lot harder to develop for Thunderbird and stuff. With Google, they have the mouse. So they can see how people are using it. They can s- look Not for only the that, They've also got the resources. So, for yeah. example, how they collapse the replies so, so that you only see the, rep- uh, I mean the replies and the, the quotes are all collapsed. And mm. they can do that server side because they've got all the resources to do it. Um, it's much harder to do it in the client. Okay. Uh, Interesting. Because generally, I have Thunderbird more just f- quickly scanning the mail, the basic thing. But I, my phone, I do a lot of my mail on. So I don't actually have a problem with any of this that they're doing. Mm. Mm. And it's important to note, it's not dead. It's an open source project. It's still open. So people going, fork Thunderbird, don't fork, contribute. 
Yeah. Mm. Just, I mean, it, Unless there's a really, really, really good reason to exactly, fork. Exactly. Like with OpenOffice, there was a good reason to fork to make LibreOffice. Yes. Mm. And eventually that proved out and kind of merged and oh, wow. Well, I don't even know what's happening in the OpenOffice world anymore, but maybe that's the topic for a different that's show. That's the topic for a I different show. I use LibreOffice. Just <laughs> I just use whatever Very comes seldom. Too, so. No, exactly. Yeah, exactly. What? Me. LibreOffice. Uh, oh, no. What I mean is uh, uh, pretty much I open all my docs in LibreOffice now. Um, mm. Or Google Docs. Admittedly, we use Google Docs a hell of a lot more nowadays. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> that said, perhaps to segue uh, uh, away from, from this open source project into something that's also looking promising, which is Core Nokia Amigo team announces a new company in Jolla. Yeah. Apparently, um, it's pronounced Zola, as in a sharp Z in the front. Oh, could, really? I could uh, is, is, that a, is that a Finnish, a Finnish think, thing? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It, it makes, uh, it's kind of weird. Uh, in Swedish, uh, when you start a word with a K, for example, it actually, it's actually a sh sound. So, mm -hmm. like, they'll spell kark, church, as K-Y-R-K-A-N, I think. And you would be tempted to say kirkan or something like that, but it's actually shirkan. Thanks, Scandinavia. Okay. <laughs> Love it. Fantastic. So say that again. It's Shola. Sola. 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 Yeah. All right. I love Almost it. Almost like TZ. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's it's like What's a Z, Z like like the Z in German. I think yeah. it's also a T. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, yes. The the core Migo team from Nokia uh, has kind of left, and they've made a new company, Sola. And they're going to be releasing, working on Migo-based devices. It's important to note, again, here, not Migo, because Migo is a trademark owned by Nokia. Uh, but they're going to be taking which Migo. Which was formerly Mimo. Which was Mibo, Mimo and Moblin, Moblin, Moblin from yep. Intel, which merged and formed Migo. I, I and then that merged with something device. else from oh, cool. the Nokia N900. N N800. Oh, the N800. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Wow. It's, it's awesome. Oh, it's really? Started, yeah. I, I saw a guy playing with an N900, and that didn't impress me much. Didn't, but it's such yeah. a hacker-friendly device. And that's why the, the people who love them are so loyal. I mean, with the N like, N800, totally. and this was back in and 2007, I could run an SSH minus X into my box and have open office just forward over the SSH connection onto my N800. That would be it was awesome. A, it was a four inch device with 800 by 480, so quite high. Cloud, density. before cloud was a thing. Yeah. yeah. It was, it was awesome. Total cool. hipster device. <laughs> so I still have it and I'm looking for someone who really wants it so I can give it away. <laughs> Uh, uh, we've got guys in IRC that are always looking for freebies. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you must want it. Yeah. You must really want uh, it. One thing to also add, uh, they're not going to be supporting any of the current yes. devices. That they're not going to be supporting by. any of the Nokia, well, the Nokia N9, yes. which is pretty much the only um, Mego device up until now. And it's also, I'm, I'm not entirely clear whether they're going to be using the same user interface. So the, the slide user interface, I think they might be licensing the patents for that from Nokia. Um, I know they're not, not going to be using the current uh, Migo release. They, they, there was a, a split previously, which was open sourced. Yep. They're going back to that and then going and then developing on, further on, on that. There. Yeah. Um, and I'm kind of excited. I mean, Migo on the N9 was pretty cool. They had some loved it. I exactly. Loved it, the loved interface it. was really cool. It was really simple. Um, and the design very, philosophy behind it, after also being able to chat that, to Marco, I was sorry. also with the N9 specifically. So hopefully they take that with them. So the hardware design along with the software design. Um, well, I don't think they get the industrial designer who worked, the lead industrial designer who worked on the project. Hopefully they take the ideas with them. Which is no button on the front face. Yes. That was such a cool idea. Mm. I really mm. liked it. Um, and, you know, it, it was they, they had some issues with memory management, so hopefully they can sort through that if they haven't already. On, on well, Migo? Yes. Okay. You, you, tested, you said with a bunch of apps open, yeah. 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 But but like bunch all, of apps open of, it started getting sluggish. All of these phones have had it when they've started. They've all when, had it when, when they started, problem. maybe. Yeah. Yeah. But they eventually sorted through yeah. it. So hopefully they'll be able no. to sort that out. And, and maybe this can become a decent also competitor. They only left once they had finished the next update for the N9, which apparently is getting released now as we speak. Oh, wow. Still getting it. Wow. So the N9 is getting updates, but current Windows Phone 7 devices aren't. Yes. But this Fantastic. will be, this will be the last. <laughs> After this, there is no Mego part in Nokia. So this is the last update yeah. ever. Oh, really? So, so um, also so much for those continual update promises. No, no, there will be support for the device, yeah. blah, 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 whatever. Anyway, yes. <laughs> Which brings us to some of the coolest gaming news to happen in cool. such a long time. Mm -hmm. is, uh, and and um, we reported on this, well, not just us, but like the whole gaming blogosphere reported on this uh, Oya, Ouya, I think is the name of the Ouya. device. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Ouya device, um, when it was first announced, and then it hit Kickstarter, I think last night or the night before. Yeah. And... So, it's just, it made so much money. Within so 24 much money hours. Pledged. So um, this is 
an Android-based console. Mm. Um, a ninety-nine dollar console. Ninety-nine dollars that they're asking for this thing. That's but and that's including one controller. Yes, uh, for two controllers, I think you add thirty dollars. Twenty, it's twenty or thirty dollars for, for the, the second sec- controller. To get the second controller, yeah. yeah. Um, Android-based, so it's running some butchered version of ice cream sandwich on there. And uh, some of the ideas that they have behind it are very interesting. They're saying that all games published for it should be free to play in some sense. So um, it's kind of like Windows Phone. Where if, if you get games on Windows Phone, you have a try and then you have a buy. So you can try any game for a certain period of time and then decide if you, wanna, if you, mm. if you actually want to buy it. But that's not that. the only option they offer. They also offer the, the business model of, like, uh, I think, League of Legends and those types of games. Free to play, well. yeah, if, um, microtransactions, in-app purchases. Or all subscription models. Like so, yeah. so you they, play. they just want free to play in some sense of it. So the, the most basic thing is a try before you buy, mm. and then you demos. can have. I, I love demos. Exactly. Yes. They, and that's they're quick to download. It's it. so much of fun, and then you can always buy it afterwards mm. if you're really into it. I don't know how often you've actually maybe bought a game and then you get a tiny way and it's like, why? Shafted. <laughs> totally. Why? And how many times I've wanted to play a demo and how, um, how many times I've actually played a demo like recently. I played the Torchlight demo and I was so impressed by it that I didn't even think twice. I just went and pre-ordered it. Yeah. Just um, to go in, they wanted uh, $950,000. Within 24 hours, they had over $2 million. What's it looking at? $3,155,000. Uh, <laughs> $305. That's, so the obvious That's in two days. Here. So the obvious question: How is this different to, like, say, a Google TV box or something like that, where 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 you uh, where you could still use a normal controller, right, and you could use it over Bluetooth? Or because something? it provides controller is geared at gaming, mm. uh, and it's also geared what, what, at, at being very hacker friendly. So they're looking at hardware hackers, they're looking at at software hackers, people to write games for it. They're also putting um, things, yeah, you know, where people can solder things on the board. Yeah, so they're making it's completely available. open. They're using well, standard um, standard so ways to get into box, it. Basically. No. They're trying and to and open up as much of it as they beautiful. possibly can. And they've, they've actually got some really good design behind model, it as huh? well. Mm-hmm. I'm and it's to the point where they say you can yeah. even start including this in TVs and stuff like that at a low stage. They're looking mm-hmm. at that. Um, what people say is this is what Google TV should have been and what the, what's it, what the Nexus, Q. Player, Nexus Q should have been. Maybe. Same price. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. Well, the Nexus Q. No, the, no, Nexus Nexus Q is, the Nexus Q is 200, 200 or isn't it $300? No, I think it was about $250 somewhere there. No, I think it was sorry. $350 because I mean, it's made in the mainly USA. Mainly so because that it's made the in the USA, up. yeah. Well, it's made in the USA and it's very much an experiment. All right. um, well, but this, uh, this will be able to do everything they can, more or less. Is, is, that, that, you is that $99 you said, hey? Yes. $99. Is, is that just for the Kickstarter backers or is that what it's going to retail? Well, for? that's they're planning on roughly selling it at that. Yeah. But maybe, okay, let's say they sell it for $50 more. It's still a good deal. Hundred and fifty dollars yeah. for a. This is a Tegra three, a gig of RAM, which I mean, it's decent. How spec. would that compare to something like an Xbox or a PS three? That'd be an interesting, an interesting comparison, interesting comparison be, because, actually, because because the, uh, the 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 old next gen consoles. This is a problem with calling something next gen or new. Mm. Um, the old next gen consoles are aging. Um, yeah. I mean, the the Xbox is not aging gracefully. Yeah. And I mean, we've seen some of the things that come out for Tegra three. Those games look really gorgeous. The the demo they showed at uh, for the ne- on running on the Nexus seven at Google I O was mind blowing. It was exactly. amazing. Yeah, really. I, I've been playing this this game. Okay, admittedly, it isn't a small screen, even if it is a relatively high resolution screen, seven twenty p. Um, a game called Dark Meadow, uh, which is for mm. Tegra Tegra games only, and the uh, the graphical detail in that game is amazing. Yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. Uh, I must actually but, get but, some but sort of HDMI out for my for my One X. But to the see thing what is, like it hardware screen. wise, it is not as powerful as an Xbox, right? Yeah. I don't. Oh, no, I no, don't think possibly so. Possibly not. But so, I, so I think it might it? be around about well, the Wii or maybe they, even they, the Wii U. They say it's far more casual ga- gamer or- orientated. Okay. Uh, but you will be able to use some media PC as well. Um, so they said 1080p playback. Mm-hmm. What's also going to be quite interesting is later on, I'm sure you're going to be able to start pairing your phones to this. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You in the Could you use the phone as a controller, maybe. That's what I'm thinking. That'd so cool. you've got the touch. It's already screen. there. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think the the controller does have a touch screen on it. Uh, yes, it does. Yeah. So thirty dollars for a touch screen controller. It's it's a uh, not touch like screen. a normal controller it's with your action sensitive. buttons. So I think it's got a touch sensitive surface so, on yes. it. And yeah. they say you want to play Angry Birds, so you can swipe and slide. But it's still going to you know show you on the screen. Okay, which well. makes a whole lot of sense because there are games built for Android that, that really need some sort of screen. touch yeah. input. Um, but I was thinking, if you now do it within consolation with your Android phone, and you have two people playing, you can have different controllers and stuff like that, or you've got the mm. full motion controllers that the Wii has. So like the Wii U, Wii U. You, you, you start having, if you use your phone, you have that same screen that they have on the Wii U controller. Mm. 
No, it, it's and, and it's interesting. And if you look at a game like I think it's called Dungeon Defenders, that mm. that debuted on Android, if I'm not mistaken. I, I speak under absolute I correction, it but it definitely it definitely um, was on mobile platforms before it hit PC. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so r- I might be wrong about the other thing, and we can uh, you can email us at haha you were wrong at ltnet.tv. And, and we will read out your mail and, and apologize. And, and, and it apologize. may have been iOS first. <laughs> yeah, it may but have been. Again, I'll have but, to check. Yeah, but but regardless, the fact is it it actually didn't come to PC. Before it hit mobile devices, mm. so and that is a game that just plays far better with a controller yep. um, than it does on a touch display. So in in this sense, you can you can build fairly. Uh, they've proven you can build fairly compelling uh, games that earn a lot of money on Steam for platforms like Android. Mm-hmm. And um, if you give it like a decent controlling mechanism, like it'll be fun to play. Also, what's interesting with the Kickstarter one is okay, they're developing this one. You know roughly how many people are going to have it from day one. Well, yeah. they've limited it. Yes, absolutely. Wow. Well, well, they have a certain amount yet. of limit. Uh, no, there, um, there are limits to the amount of people that can uh, donate to the project. Yeah. Um, for each for each tier, but you have thousands of people that can, you know, for for the lowest one or for the ninety nine dollar one, I think you have twenty thousand, fifty thousand people that can that can donate. Well, what, um, I'm, what I'm thinking is, at the end of this, you're going to know how many people have this game console. Yeah. Then you're also going to go. Well, you've also got the fallback that you've got the phone that you can develop for. If your app doesn't work, um, so ideally, yeah. So but they, they, they do have their own SDK. It'll be interesting to see. Apparently, how they ship it with the console, which is quite cool. the SDK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, they, they offer all kinds of incentives for developers. By the way, um, uh, the the main developer incentive is sold out already. The the only one that's left is the lead option, I think, which uh, you get for one three three seven dollars, and that gives you a hotline into Oya. Oya. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So, which uh, and that's a hotline. That's an email address hotline. A closely guarded secret. Blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. That's uh, gonna leak so quick. Yeah. <laughs> for if you've got issues. Yeah. Um. And uh. But yeah. The 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 first the, the lowest price developer tier has sold out already. Mm-hmm. Um. I don't even remember what that was. It was like two hundred and twenty five dollars or. It uh, was around there somewhere. Yeah. No. Mm-hmm. Oh, a bit higher than that. I mean, mm-hmm. it must have been somewhere between the two hundred and twenty five dollar option and the one three three seven option. I think. Um. So it sold out. Pretty damn quickly. So there are going to be already a, a good number of developers with with this box in their hands. Um, Sorry, just a quick comment from the RSC. With uh, them doing so well, they should get net dynamics to track the sales. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that meme is that <laughs> meme has got legs. <laughs> it's got legs. Uh, thanks, uh, Mickey. Anyway, uh, Toby. Now t- we've we've spoken about like future Android development on what looks to be a very exciting console, but you've been doing current Android development on existing devices. So, um, uh, how, uh, let's let's run through some of your apps. And I've been to your page. You've got you've got quite a few. So. Yeah, so I mean, I've been doing this since 2010. So um, I've over the over the years, I've d- done quite a few. But unfortunately, I'm not allowed to talk about all of them. Uh, you know, a lot of them go into, into the, the clients' names and so on. Mm. But uh, some of the ones that I've put on for free, my my best app is um, well, my best in terms of number of downloads is called Battery Foo. and um, it's got at the moment to about 215,000 downloads. So I'm quite proud of that fact. Um, it's basically a battery saver for for Android phones, and mm. it seems to work really well, especially on Samsung devices and so on. Um, check that out. Then I've got <laughs> my, my first app was actually called SMS Foo, and it was I must say it was quite badly written. But as you learn Android, you, you sort of understand. Ooh, I yeah. should have done that, and I should have done that. So what I did was recently, a um, couple of days ago, actually, I, I sat down and I actually updated the whole app with new stuff. So it does uh, proper list uh, displays and it's smooth scrolling and mm, all of that mm. kind of stuff. ICS, be- ICS sort of way of doing things. Well, it works on ICS, I can tell you that much. But I didn't, um, I didn't make it sort of hollow theme and stuff like that, which Herod <laughs> is going to kill me for. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. But I mean, there's, like the, there's the, a reasoning the button, behind yes, that at least. The the the, so the menu button and that sort of stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. So so well. Uh, yeah, it'll, it'll work fine. Uh, if you've got a menu button, it'll show on a menu button. I don't know how, what it's going to look like on a tablet, but it's not even going to run on a tablet because it needs telephony. Okay, okay. Unless, your, unless your tablet does have telephony. I haven't tested it. But essentially what SMS Foo does is it, it kind of... Uh, one of the things that used to annoy me was spam SMSs. And I noticed that they all come from long numbers. You know, those uh, click or tell gateways yes, and whatever. Yeah. So I thought, okay, this is a cool way. Just if it's a long number... Don't buzz me. Don't delete it. I'd like to read it at some point, but just don't in- irritate me in the middle of a meeting. So that's what that's what SMS Foo was born from, and it, it works exactly like that. But you can also say, well, only if the uh, the po- uh, person trying to contact me is in my contact list, then buzz and so on, right? Mm-hmm. And that works quite uh, well. So that was one of my, but not so successful apps. Obviously, it was very low profile and so on. Um, 
One of my favorite apps at the moment is SA Events. Uh, that's that's the one that, that pulls through events that are happening in your province. And I haven't updated it for a while, but I've actually been working feverishly on it. And I hope to have an update like with, uh, within the next you're, couple of weeks. You're telling me of a couple couple of new features and everything that you're doing in the back. Yeah. I'm not going to mention them, but, but it so, sounds so, very, so, very so cool. So I think Harry's going to be happy about the fact that I, it now uses <laughs> Hollow Theme. So <laughs> I like so, Hollow so Theme. It's all, uh, it works well on a tablet, and I'm going to be improving that even more. Uh, one of the things about uh, every time a new version of Android <laughs> comes out, like Android 4.1 or, or ICS came out and stuff, it's hard for a developer to get excited about it because you know it's going to be like a year down the line before anyone gets it, right? Yeah, that too. So, so the things that excites me is when when d other developers bring out libraries that bring backwards compatibility. So Android is, I mean, uh, Google as well, they bring out the um, compatibility package. Mm. So they, every time they update it, that's cool. You know? So th for example, now they've added some of the Jelly Bean notification stuff uh, into the compatibility package so you can get okay. some of it, not all of it. Mm. But now Jake Wharton, who's one of the, the, the developers behind Action Bar Sherlock, one of the most popular libraries. So if you're an Android developer, you really need to look at uh, Action Bar Sherlock. But he's now uh, added the, the expandable notification stuff as well to, to the compatibility li uh, library and so on. Cool. So mm. th that's the stuff that gets me excited. So what I do is I then incorporate that into my app. So my app can look like an ICS app even on, a, on an Android 2. Point whatever device. So that's quite cool. So I'm using that in SA Events. And for me, SA Events is also a bit of a learning experience. I, I experiment with new technologies, but make sure that it's still backwards compatible and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. uh, and where, do you, where do you pull the data for, for SA Events from? Okay, so the the data for SA Events specifically, the, especially the current version, comes from a, a website called savenues.com. And I don't even hide the fact that I, I pull it from there. If you go to the about page, you will see that it comes from there. And currently, in fact, your app, the app actually scrapes the website directly, right? So there's no back end and so on. It, it hits that website. But what it does do is uh, savenues.com provides a feed. So it's meant to be embedded into other websites. I take that feed. I format it and display it in the native app. But now what I'm doing is I'm building a whole backend infrastructure and trying to get it clustered and so on so that it doesn't fall over when I go live. Um, and I'm going to pull in more information. So n next up will be motorsports. Um, so along with the new UI, you'll get some new uh, events. And I'm going to start pulling in maybe uh, events from things like meetup.com and so on. So I'm going to try and relevant events because it's something I use personally. The other thing I found is that I keep forgetting to look at it. So like two months down the line, oh, I missed that event, you know? Yeah, so yeah. what I'm going to do is start adding notifications so you can put keywords in it and we'll start notifying you and so on. But I'll roll these out slowly over time because this is one of my long-term projects that I'm doing in my spare time. Um, uh, Some of us, uh, are those all freeware or do you have some paid for apps? Uh, so the, the apps I talked about currently are freeware, but I do have paid for apps. Well, I've got one paid for app and that's the uh, Simple Zulu uh, app. Which How do is you manage that? Uh, so I actually had a partnership with a client. So the, the Simple Zulu is a flashcard app. It's a very simple app. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it really just yeah. took me a couple of days to write that, right? But all of the graphics and the, and the uh, multimedia for the app came from a, an, a, another provider. Mm -hmm. So they, they, for example, make multimedia and books and so on. So what I did was uh, he's got an account in the UK. So mm -hmm. he registered a Google merchant account in the UK, and then I uh, and then he uploaded the app. So then we okay. share the revenue. So that's okay. how that works. Yeah, because um, we don't actually have uh, support for paid for apps for developers yeah, to upload apps. For, and for Google Play, it. yes, yes. But we can get paid. Uh, we can put through paid the apps Samsung Store through the Samsung Store and okay. Vodacom Store. And I, I would highly yes. recommend that any local developers look at that because um, first of all, the number of downloads, uh, especially if it's a South African app, you'll get much more downloads on uh, Samsung apps and Vodacom apps than on Google Play because you get featured, right? The, mm. Your chance of getting featured are much higher. Mm. Uh, and therefore, you can monetize it quite well. Uh, How does the Vodacom App Store uh, work? I mean, I'd, like, uh, I, I you don't actually... need to put a credit card in, so it actually takes it takes it off your airtime. So it's called uh, carrier billing. Okay, so that's quite cool. And and d d does the store ship on Android devices that that you get from Vodacom? Apparently, or? it does. I haven't got I a haven't device. Seen one? I haven't like seen that. one, I but I haven't got other. a Vodacom device in a while. Okay, so uh, but but uh, yes, it does ship. Uh, there are different uh, versions of the store. So there's a, a, a portal that you go to, and then you can start downloading apps. But the whole portal is handled by a company called. Um, appia.com mm. and they and they sort of white label this um, app store for mm. Mm. multiple carriers throughout the world so they actually have a, a massive app store but what's uh, what's cool about the Vodacom app store is that you can go to Vodacom and say hey this is a South African app that I developed and get them to feature it on the local app store Very which cool. which is quite powerful yeah. okay uh, that actually yeah. answers a question I was actually going to ask because I've seen a couple of apps now coming out in the Sony app store 
Um, Sony has an app store. Sony Sam, 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 Samsung. Oh, yeah. Samsung. Oh. Samsung app store. <laughs> Samsung app store. <laughs> like I know the Stukinical came out there and it's yeah. not coming up to me. And to me, it was just more irritating because I tend to. But if that's where they're getting paid for South Africa, now makes perfect sense of why. Mm. Well, I, I didn't well the, Sa- the Samsung app store uses credit cards. So that's slightly different. Yeah. Is the Samsung... Uh, I'm a little clueless about it. Is it available for non-Samsung devices? No. Okay. So it's no, only for. Yeah. But don't forget that Samsung devices are by far the the most popular. Yeah. In, yes. In, in, yeah. So but unfortunately, I'm a One X user, so now I I, I can't. No, I couldn't access Flipboard or um, the uh, until now until recently, yeah. and I also can't get the Stokinico app, which is uh, incredibly which is frustrating. Is yes, exactly. So so Samsung are quite clever <laughs> because they they have good relationships with the developers. So one of the cool things I can go and speak to Adrian D at Samsung. You know, which which is quite a powerful relationship to have. Unfortunately, no, no other manufacturer has done that, so you can kind of mm. blame HTC or Motorola and, for that. And, and what's interesting though is that Leaf actually have their own Android store. It's, it's not they well had. known. I, I think open open Leaf or whatever. Open it's market, yeah. yeah. It's still so around. That, that no, was before. No, so that was that was purely a ploy by Leaf to force. Uh, Google's hand in bringing the market to South Africa. South Africa. So when they launched the G1, there was no Android market on it, which kind of made the device completely useless. Yeah. So what Leaf, uh, so Leaf begged and begged and said, please, Google, bring your market. And Google just weren't interested. I mean, we, we're such a small player. So then Leaf said, okay, we're going to develop our own market okay. and we're going to ship it with our devices and uh, preload it. And they did that. And just a few months into it, Google said, okay, fine, we'll bring our, our app store in. I don't know if it would, the reason was purely from because of open market. Yeah, yeah. But in but any it case, also it was worked. just free apps. I mean, yeah. we, we only had it access to free apps. Uh, uh, well, uh, I think they were looking to pay it as, but at some stage it fell away and they stopped. Uh, no, 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 I mean, it was free apps on the Google Play. On, Go- oh, on, on Android Google Play, market. yes. Yeah. 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 So you can buy, yeah. So it, was, it wasn't that long ago when they said, okay, you can now buy apps locally. Yeah. But unfortunately, and I was wa- hoping that Google IO would make this announcement that, that South Africa supported. Merchants. I was also merchants. hoping for yeah. it. Um, but they did announce a, a few extra countries. So look, they I, are I think working on it. And the fact that we've got live traffic and you know things like that, mm. which it's which are quite along. quite resource intensive, and for for Google to bring that to this country means that they are kind of taking it seriously. So I think, look, at this stage, I, I would guess that there's about two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand Android devices in South Africa that's being used, which oh. isn't a lot. I mean, maybe when we get to a million, then Google will be interested and say, okay, fine, now you can be merchants. But at this stage, I, I think our market's still too small for them to. But but I mean, the 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 thing is, as merchants, the we shouldn't just be looking at our local. Install base surely, because as a South African merchant um, we or, could or sell developer, globally. yeah, you can sell globally. So yeah. your market isn't just South Africans. I agree, y- yeah. Your your what what you should be looking at is is the, the quality of developer that would come from South Africa yeah. and go. You know, do we do we do we incentivize these people but, but that putting is, stuff into that is, our market? That is, that is another point as well because I think when you look at most of the apps that are being developed in South Africa, they're being developed overseas, so they're being outsourced and so on. Only now, in the in the say in the last six months or so, we've had a lot of new developers coming into the market and a lot of locally developed apps. I think FMB kind of led the way there. Yeah. They started hiring really talented developers and and they got into the game. And then all of the other players started looking and saying, okay, well, this is the way to do it. Mm. Uh, I've seen some shock bad outsourced apps being released and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's good to see that we're picking up. So maybe that's the other factor. Yeah. That without are without naming well. names uh, or admitting any guilt, um, the, 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 the big thing is that apps are expensive to develop. So a lot of South African businesses, if you're looking yeah. at business apps like yeah. FNB, I don't think uh, they had to invest a significant amount of money. I'm not sure if the, the money is... is uh, Recovered. If, uh, yeah, no, 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 if that, if that figure is public domain not knowledge yet. But... Um, the, I mean, uh, developers in South Africa are an expensive breed. Yeah. Um, well, not just in South Africa. I think development of, of smartphone apps in general is way more expensive than people realize. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's actually... Than like web development, for yeah, example. Yeah, than web development. It, with, with is this due to the amount of people? I think, I think, first of all, it's a very specialized skill. So I think it's also a supply and demand thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's so it, mean, it does yeah. kind of have a bubble going for it at the moment. Yes. And, um, and, and it'll yes. probably pop at some stage. But yeah. at this stage, the, you get a lot of people that say, okay, I can do Android development. But now how do you know that the guy is good or not? Because you can't say, Give me, well, I want to see five years of experience. But, you know, that's impossible. Okay, two years of experience, which I have, is, is quite cool. Yeah, but show me, um, show me your apps sh- Show me market. your apps and whatever, yeah. Mm. So, or give me an APK. Yeah, yeah. So, so I always advise developers, just put some apps out there and use that as your CV. Portfolio, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And that's one of the reasons why I keep putting out free apps. Okay. I just, just want to ask, I had a question here from RSC. I'm just going to find it now again quickly. Um, is the Vodacom app store available from MTN just before we go too far away? No, it's not. MTN it. have their own app store. 
And I don't know what's happening with it. But I isn't the Vodacom app store just down, can't you just download it for any phone? Or is it s only on select phones? Actually, you don't need to download it because it's actually a web link. It's so a web link. Yeah. So when you install the app store, it's actually just a bookmark to a website, right? Yeah. Um, so that literally launches your browser. It doesn't even yeah, open its own yeah. canvas. Or anything. But, then, but then when you want to purchase, I think it needs your, your phone number, right? I haven't actually oh, gone through the book. Yeah, so, so yeah, it's okay, carryable. For, for purchased apps, you might not be able you might not be able to, to buy to apps, buy them. but you can probably get free apps. It's well, likely. I haven't tried it myself. Because, so. I mean, the Amazon App Store, you can't get free apps. Well, the Amazon App Store the isn't, even app store isn't allowed available here. in South Africa. Yeah. Well, and the when Vodacom App Store is available in Vodacom. So, I mean. Well, I, look, I, I don't think they'll stop you from connecting from another network, for example. But um, I don't know how far they let you in. So, I haven't actually tried this out. I, it might actually. I have an ATM phone, asked, so we can try it. Yeah. Cool. Um, I also do. So I yeah. sent an article cool. coming. I have another question that's been given by the mixer, so I have to ask it. Yes. Apparently, I must ask about Blue Mote. Okay. Oh, cool. <laughs> 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 All right. So, um, I, as I mentioned earlier on, I also do some stuff at House for Hack. Uh, and for the guys who don't know, House for Hack is basically a bunch of engineers who get together and build cool stuff just because Very we can. Cool. And right. we're going to be moving there uh, yeah. within it's a month. Awesome. Fourth of August. I think. Yes. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. I can't wait to have you guys there. So uh, one of the things that we developed there is a thing called Blue Mode. And mm -hmm. um, they had this competition at Momo Joburg, which is this mobile uh, event that happens, you know, sort of once in a month or mobile so. Mobile Monday, right? Mobile Monday, yeah. that's right. Um, and uh, it draws quite a good crowd these days, I think especially because of the free drinks. <laughs> so anyway, they had this competition. <laughs> that does the job. Yeah. So they had this competition where um, the idea was to pitch projects. Uh, it, was, it was called Ideas innovations to change the world, right? So um, I pitched this uh, idea of Blue Mode, and I made a little video of a, of a it was like a zombie video, which kind of showed me being chased by zombies and dropping my keys and trying to unlock my phone to make an emergency call. And the whole point of it was that it's, it's actually impossible to operate your smartphone while you're in a panic situation. So um, especially with lock, lock screens and, and, and the like. Mm. So uh, what Blue Mode is, is actually a physical key, uh, a remote control, like a key fob with four buttons on it. And uh, I think you can see it on the screen now. And, yep. and the, the, s the board that you see there is actually the dev board that I demoed it with. And uh, you pair it up with your smartphone. And once it's paired up, you'd, you'd, you'd have to leave your Bluetooth on, but it doesn't connect until it's needed. So it doesn't drain your battery. And at any okay. point, you can hit one of those buttons and they'll do different things. So I've written an app, um, and it's open source. So, so if you go to houseforhack.co.za forward slash blue mode, B-L-U-M-O-T-E, uh, then you'll get all the details, and you can get into the GitHub, and you can you can compile it for yourself, and you can play with it. The, even the, the the Eagle files are there for the yeah. I was going to ask. So the right? schematics for the, the actual schematics hardware. are there, and it's actually based on Arduino and open source hardware. So you could build it just with an Arduino instead of actually so soldering up the circuit yourself. Hmm. Um, so some of the things that I programmed in the the one button would di directly dial an emergency number like one or triple one. Um, so or one one two in the case of a yeah phone, of, right? of, of a phone yeah. So uh, what you do is. Uh, Typically, when you get pulled over, uh, or if you got, uh, if you were in a hijack situation where you were stopped at a robot, and someone puts a gun to your window, then you could just uh, press the button and then step away, right? It doesn't. You don't have to grab your phone because the the first thing they want is your phone. So you just walk away, and then they can take your phone and car, but your phone would be dialing emergency, or it would be okay. So the second button would send out SMSs with your location and so on. The third button, I, I pre-programmed it for voice records, which is actually quite cool. You can leave your phone anywhere, and because Bluetooth's got quite a good range, you can, you can sort of <laughs> leave it in a boardroom or something and hit the button, and it will record for 10 minutes. But the idea here was if you get pulled over by a cop, just press the button, and the whole, whole conversation will get recorded. Okay? Um, and the, the last button, I, c I can't remember all the... So there's a lot of features that you could, you could configure them for. In fact, mm. you could stack them up. In fact, the last button was to open the gate at House for Hack because one of the uh, we've got an app to do that, yeah. but I keep having to unlock my phone, turn on <laughs> my 3G, and then press the button to open the gate. And, you know? That's so what I like about that is like I think even I'm going to get a boom, you'd have to like take your phone out your pocket. Yeah. Where now you can have it on your, your keychain and key just chain. push the button. And, and we were thinking of a pendant that you could also have. So we're going to experiment with different form factors than a watch. So uh, at least some smartphone available uh, function, function, functionality is available like whenever. Mm -hmm. So w I'm hoping that you know, like some people will jump onto the open source version and start, uh, because it's a lot of software development work now to try and make it configurable. Uh, one of the things mm. we thought of was to make a plugin for Tasker. If you don't know what Tasker is, it's yeah. like you can, you can configure your phone like when you get to work 
then do something and mm, so on. Mm. So you could say, when it's, I'm at work and I press this button, do this. But like when I'm at home and I press this button, do this. And it's so like on. a very advanced version of if this, then that. Yes, exactly. For Android. No, if exactly. If or, if or, if or, or on X from Microsoft. On X, I was going to ask you about that. Which yeah. requires a, a Facebook thing. login. Yeah, a Facebook login. But I mean, have you I played, played with it? Yes, yeah. I did How play is with it? it. It is fantastic. Actually, it works, but it is a little bit buggy. So the nice thing about it is that they've got some pre-configured recipes which work really well. Uh, but like it, it needs to if if you've got a recipe that's that's location based. So for example, I go to House for Hack at least once a week. So I, I added a recipe that says text my wife. I'm on my way when I leave House for Hack. That's so cool. what so what you do is you just put in the the GPS coordinates of House for Hack, and then you you put your wife's number and you put the the message that you want to send. And that was actually quite cool, I thought. And then. Uh, it, every time you, you switch on your phone, it says, oh, sorry, your GPS is off and some of your rules require that it be on and stuff like that. So then, okay, fine. I, I left my GPS on, but it didn't always work. Mm. And uh, it's also got a, a sort of mode of transport detection where it, it can figure out whether you're walking, whether you're driving, or whether you're stationary. And so it uses that for a lot of the recipes as well. Like, um, let's say you're walking, it will uh, automatically launch the music player or something like that, right? Um, or when you get up in the morning and you and you start walking, it will um, f the first time uh, you pick up your phone, it will display the weather for the day, or it will display the weather only if it's going to be raining. It'll give you a warning, stuff like that. So there's a lot of cool stuff that's there, and I actually saw it as a nice way to learn programming as well because it's JavaScript based and it's very simple. They give you a nice sort of um, API, and you just say if mode of transport equals this, then do that, and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's it's, it's, it's it's fun to play with, but I haven't found it to be practically as useful as I thought it would be. So I eventually ended up uninstalling it, but it mm. is definitely worth playing with. Yeah, definitely. yeah. And but uh, integrating something like that with uh, Blue, Blue Mode, mode. Uh, is, is would that be possible, or is Task uh, not, not, pretty much the only way? Not with Microsoft's one because they don't have a plug-in system, right? Okay. And in fact, when you install Onyx, you can't do anything on your phone. You have to do it on the cloud. But the the, the minute you make a change and you save it, it pushes it to your phone, which is quite fun actually. But uh, Task gives you a plug-in system, so you can write uh, events. And, and a blue mode button would be an event. Mm. And then you can link that up to actions, which mm. Task already has a whole bunch of. So at least I wouldn't have to go and write all of those. Uh, and the actions. really awesome thing about Tasker now is they've released an app that lets you make Tasker, Tasker events and package them as apps. And oh, publish that's them, awesome. You can publish them to the Play Store and you can even sell those then. That is awesome. Wow. That is awesome. Because, yeah. because ultimately, all of these generic tools, the problem with them is that they're generic, so they're very difficult to use. So if you can package a simple rule, like text my wife when I'm leaving House mm. Hack, and you package that as an app, it's, it's actually more useful than Tasker itself. Yeah. Because most people don't want to... They don't want to go through, through the hassle of configuring yeah. Tasker. Right. And it's the same, thing, and the same thing with Blue Mode, right? When, when I uh, conceived of Blue Mode, it was purely to open the gate at House Hack. But then, uh, so I made it this generic thing where you can press a button and you can configure it to do anything. But then I thought about it... And especially when I entered the competition, I thought, no, actually target a use case. And the use case was panic buttons. And if you target a specific use case, it's much easier to package and sell it. Mm. And then you can make a whole diff bunch of different packages for yeah. that. And then know. at the end of it, you go, and it's configurable too. Exactly. Mm. And you can get the source and do whatever you want yes. with it as well. And mm. it's also for the what person who really wants to hack and knows how to do it, you can do it. And for the person who doesn't, it's prepackaged. And exactly. exactly. I mean, it's hackable from every perspective. Yes. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so actually, what what we did do, uh, Blue Mode's actually a the question, a by the way, because the, the mixer isn't mic'd up, is do you do custom orders? <laughs> okay, sorry, right, so for, for a good reason, we, we don't want to blow the mic. So so so, <laughs> so one of the, uh, the the things about House for Hack is that we we're building all of this cool stuff, and there's people who want it, and and we don't have an easy way to like put the two together. So what we did is we soft launched this House for Hack store. Uh, it's uh, it's just houseforhack.co.za slash shop. And we started uploading like one or two things that we think ugh, people might be interested in. So Blue Mode's one of them. So you can pre-order a Blue Mode. But we haven't decided on the final form factor. So we're still playing on Google SketchUp and with 3D printers and trying to print cases and see what will work and so on. Uh, and so we thought, okay, let's see if they, you know, and you can obviously when you pre-order, you can send a message saying, can you, can you make it do this or can you make it do that? Or people can contribute designs or, or changes and so on. And mm -hmm. then we can mm -hmm. incorporate and we can even do one-offs because of the 3D printer, the printers that we've got. Yeah. So wouldn't it, wouldn't 3D printing the case be far more expensive than getting... It would, yes. Absolute, than doing it mass, absolutely more expensive. But here's the cool thing. Like, uh, let's say I wanted a, a, a case, a, a docking station for this a Galaxy Note, right? The problem is it's got, a, it's got this case on it. Where am I going to get a dock that this is going to fit into that goes around this case? And you mm. might have a different case and so on. So that's where 3D printing comes in because now we can sell a docking station for this Note with this case. 
So if you've got this combination, there you go. It will be more expensive, but at least you can get it. Also, it, it's it's only more expensive if you're not making if you're making less than a thousand. You know, with the other one, you've got to get molds. You've got to do you know. Yeah. So when you're making yeah. more than a certain quantity, so like then so it even if you're making a hundred yeah. of it, you find the three D printer might be cheaper. It might, well, be, yeah. It, it so might be the same. I don't think the 3D printer will ever be the se- will ever be cheaper. Well, how hmm. would you, how would you no, go actually, about actually, actually, the mold? 3D printer isn't as expensive as you think because we we the, our, our main cost is the plastic, the, the yep. plastic filament that we buy. Mm. So we can buy uh, this guy's got wangled a deal with a bulk order and so on. So we can get a filament roll f- uh, of uh, I don't it's one kilo, right, for about 350 rand. Which means that if we printed a, That's uh, a lot of plastic, if yeah, if we printed a, a case for Blue Moat, that will probably cost us less than two rand, right? So the the problem though is is it takes a lot of time to yeah. print, yeah. right? So we can't print big stuff and and a dock, for example, I, I printed a Galaxy Nexus dock, which you might be interested in. Hey, yeah, um, that dock took uh, best part of like hour and a half, two hours to print. So. Yeah, it does, it does take a while. So we can't do bulk orders, which yeah. is why we think that the House for Hack store is actually quite cool because it's for one-off stuff or it's for low-volume stuff. And we, we're launching uh, Blue Mode as a beta product. So basically, you get to play with it, you get to test it, and you get to give us feedback, and we'll, you know, we'll kind of change the product as we go along, that mm. kind of thing, mm. Mm. Cool. Which, which we think is a new thing. I, I, yeah. I'm really looking forward to getting to the House for Hack and being there a lot more. It's going to be, be just amazing. Just see all the stuff that's going on. Dude, on you should see some of the stuff. Like people bring we, – we, we, we have get-togethers on Tuesdays, right? Yeah. So anyone's welcome to come see us on Tuesdays. And uh, this last last week, these guys brought this little um, arc. It was like a, a wire with a copper heatsink, and it creates this plasma, like uh, electric arc, right? Yeah. But it's a it's a plasma, and then they play music through it. And oh, we had like oh, a, cool. they made a miniature one of those. Yeah. So, it's, so that is a so plasma, awesome. A plasma speaker, and we we're like Metallica playing through this plasma. That was awesome. This week, the guy brought an uh, a handheld inkjet printer. And uh, it's washed <laughs> off now, but but you can you basically take the inkjet cartridge, a standard HP cartridge, hooked up to an Arduino through a shield, and uh, you just type a message in the computer, and then you just swipe your hand, uh, swipe it across your hand or paper or whatever, and it just, <laughs> it just prints it, inkjet prints it onto the onto whatever. <laughs> nice, cool. such cool stuff, you know. We're gonna have so much fun. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Even if you don't show other people, <laughs> we all see it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. 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 Um, so, with that, uh, if there are no more questions from the IRC, uh, we're going to move on to our next topic, and then you can still ask us questions in IRC, yes, and we can come back. Asking, we'll come back. So, um, the the other big news that's come out, um, there, there might be articles about this already, but apparently there's just been a tweet um, that uh, Hubble has discovered Pluto's fifth moon. Um, so, okay, I do have a question on this one. Pluto is not even a planet. <laughs> How does it have moons? <laughs> maybe maybe Pluto is a moon, and all of the others are just... It's just a moons bunch of moons circling each other. Moons. But moons can have moons. But, but then Pluto isn't moons? a moon, because it's not... It's no, a yeah, it, <laughs> oh. But then maybe we should call them satellites or something, rather than moons. Rather than moons. Or should they be... Or what are we going to have? Pseudo-moons. Or rocks. Proto-moons. Because I hear it's, it's what, uh, 10 kilometers across or something like that? So what is that? That's a rock. <laughs> <laughs> floating a, a, island a, a big one yeah yeah anyway and so the other known moons of pluto um are charon nix uh, and nix and hydra and then p4 um so uh, for those for those of you who know something about the mass effect universe the relay to the sol system which is I don't know why they call it Sol. I mean, call it Helios or something cool. Anyway, so that's our solar system. It's always our solar system in science fiction novels, the Sol system. Um, the mass relay is the Charon mass relay in Mass Effect. So named after, named after the, the first... Something that has very little mass is the mass relay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it's, it's not... Uh, the mass relay is beyond it. That's oh, what it was called. Okay. Uh, it's beyond Pluto and its moons. Here's an interesting stuff. suggestion from IRC. We call them moonlets. Moonlets, there we go. Moonlets. I like that. <coughs> Definition of a moon. A secondary planet or satellite revolving about any member of the solar system. Oh, so hang on a second. Damn. If you've got like a two planet, sort of two planets like orbiting around one another, orbiting around a... A sun. Oh, a well, star. You that's re- you that's re- a planet really and a moon. Have yeah. Yeah. You but really the one of them is a moon by that but definition. The one r- wouldn't really... <laughs> They're both moons. No, no, one has to revolve around the other. So it's not like them both revolving around each other. 
So it's not okay. like doing this, but we're actually revolving around. Although this. they were saying that uh, what's a Sharon is is half the size of Pluto. So technically, they are actually revolving around each other in a in a binary planetary sort of system. Planetoid. Yeah. I'm down with moonlets. We're Look, totally calling them moonlets from yeah, now on. I'm happy with. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, I see you guys rock. <laughs> we'll give that one to Hedgehog. Yep. We'll call it. We'll call it. Well, we have. You have to name it after Hedgehog's moonlets. <laughs> Hedgehog's moonlets. Rad. <laughs> okay, so printing running shoes. Who put yes. that? Yeah. That's from the mixer. Oh, not no, from the mixer. For me. Okay, uh, cool. I wasn't prepared for. Um, <laughs> basically, one of the guys. He's. I think he's from the BBC. Uh, I can't remember what university. It's sort of like an art university. Okay. Um, basically, his final year project was uh, to print running shoes. Okay. Um, and basically, where, where the great thing is that with this, one of the problems is the inflexibility of the running shoe. So you can't use it for long distance, but it's very highly geared for uh, sprinters. And one of the big reasons why it's so awesome is you can print it exactly to the runner's foot. Also, it's incredibly strong and very light. Um, Royal College of Art in London. Even to the point where you can make certain bits more flexible, less flexible, depending on the runner's style. And with this new running shoes, he gets a 0.35% improvement. So they say like on a 10 second runner, that's Three, uh, it's, it's it's thirty uh, point three five seconds, seconds yeah. which they say which in actual fact big. is huge. Mm -hmm. um, That'll give you the edge. Meter sprint. Um, never mind that. That's that's world record breaking, yep. significantly more that, than we've actually been having recently, um, just through three uh, D printers, better and shoes, printers being around and and getting better uh, materials. Uh, this one, as far as I know, is, it's it's lasers basically. Mm -hmm. So they've got a. A powder compound that with lasers to mm -hmm. edge it out. Mm -hmm. So it's not like in House of Hack, which is the... Uh, yeah, not, not the plastic. plastic. The, yeah. This yeah. is the expensive yeah. stuff. Yeah. 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 In, um, in fact, that is so advanced because they can they can mix materials and they can make different um, different parts of the same structure have different flexibilities and so on. And they call it metamaterials. And what happens is that they can print stuff that is unmanufacturable. Like you cannot manufacture this in any other way because like you'll have some sort of say like a, a rod that's flexible in the middle but hard in the ends and so on right which is amazing yeah Very which is pretty difficult to make nunchucks uh, without the chain <laughs> <laughs> it just makes you realize what, what we, we we're hitting and all the amazing things we're going to yeah. be able to do and create and that it's know, a whole different manufacturing process process yes let's industrialize this and make huge amounts of money well, how would you industrialize it? You'd have, to have That's part thousands of, the of printers. Well, <laughs> Pretty much. Better, you'd have to and cheapen the, my, cheapen my the production is, cost. What's this going to do to, like, you know, nowadays you'd have to go to shoe to buy your uh, store to buy your shoe. Yeah, shoe Sorry. to buy your store. <laughs> yeah. you know, exactly. Like, download or download plans, hopefully by paying for them and not pirating them. Uh, if it's well, <laughs> unless it's possible. open source shoes. Um, and print them. Yeah. Yes. But, but soon, uh, the, never mind that. You're, if you get the plans, you can print them. So how are they going to stop people from pirating them? Oh, this was, I know we've discussed this in a previous show, but yeah, I mean, eventually, you know, pirating, pirating real-world goods uh, might become a, a something that people have to worry about. And, and it always starts off really cool, like, like what we're doing at House for Hack, where we download stuff from Thingiverse, which is like this repository of 3D objects. That's the coolest so website name in the world, by yeah, the way. <laughs> yeah, so, so for example, we got a Raspberry Pi, and we thought, we need a case. Uh, who's going to design one? Oh, let's just check Thingiverse. Oh, wow, like 10 or 20 cases that we could download and print. And they're just awesome. We just download and print it. That's and how it starts, right? It's very cool and yeah. everything. But slowly, a company will start... Uh, putting designs out and someone steals it and pirates it. And, and all of a sudden there's DRM for 3D printing. Yeah, there we go. Say no. <laughs> Say no now. Okay, that, that is stop the, that stuff right but, now. But that is the worst is, possible future. But isn't, isn't that why uh, Pirate Bay started um, this whole 3D yes. section? They, yeah. they, they have a thing. Uh, they sort of preempted the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. They said, well, if it's going to happen anyway, let's start. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Also, <laughs> added to that, though, with a lot of these most cools, it's hackers you can pretty much build your own. Uh, 3D well, with within reason your own 3D printers and stuff like that. So as long as that thing keeps on going and guys keep on going, well, you can build your own. You can try to get around the DRM mm. because you can just build your own without the DRM. So as long as we keep on doing that and keep on building these things, um, eventually there is no way they can put DRM in. Mm. This is the kind of unprintable, unprintable. I mean, unmanufacturable stuff that you can print now. So cool. D I must have one to put on my desk. Can, yeah, can you awesome. can you print that with those normal flat flatbed ones, uh, no. or do you need a special? No, printer this, for this? this is printed with those laser ones because they they kind of work in a powder, 
and they sort of uh, print into the powder, which means they can make a, a 3D structure without it collapsing. The ones that we've got uh, print like an inkjet printer, which yes. means it can't print in thin air, so it can't put, make big overhangs. Although surprisingly, it can make small overhangs. Um, so there is th there are different ways of printing as well. But by the way, speaking of printers printing themselves, we did actually do that the, with the wrap. Uh, yeah, so we used we, no. We, well, we had a rep wrap, and then we got a maker bot. Yes, and then we used them uh, both of them to print out parts for a third one called Printer Bot, which was one of the Kickstarter projects. So, <laughs> so th those guys <laughs> published their designs for the for the Printer Bot, and there's a guy Peter at House for Hack who built his own Printer Bot, and he he did it at at a fairly low cost, and now he's uh, putting together kits that are roughly in the region of about six and a half thousand. You can have your own Printer Bot, which is very cool. Nice. Yeah. And the, the software to be able to run these 3D The software printers? is actually surprisingly, even though it's really complex, to take a model and slice it up and, and feed it to a printer in a way that's printable, uh, there, there's actually lots of open source ones. So uh, MakerBot comes with its own one called Replicator G. RepRap mm -hmm. comes with one called, um, um, what, what is it? It's the one that I've used in one of my apps as well. Uh, you can 3D print from Android using this app. Mm. Um, and, and that's a Python-based uh, one. Then there's one called Slicer which uh, Peter is raving about, says it's one of the better slices. So there's lots of people experimenting with different algorithms and so on, but mm. uh, most of them are, are free and open source. So, cool. so you won't, you, you won't have to be done in that area. Yeah, you won't have issues with the software. Yeah. So, so and if, if people are wondering about the next big thing, uh, you know, coming around when we're talking about, uh, I, I know um, uh, Steve Wozniak was talking about, you know, that the Apple II of robotics needs to come around and that'll be the next big thing. This looks like it's going to be the next big thing. So, like, well, th this th is th there's there's two sides to that. Like, a lot of people say, yeah, well, you know, everyone thinks 3D printers is the answer to the to the world's problems. But well, you then can't print you food, so that's a, I well, mean, no, it's no a actually, you can print you can print human tissue now. So they're actually starting to print kidneys, organs. I, th uh, I think there was a TED video about, and, mm, yes. and they actually showed the real organ, and it's a working organ. So we we're probably going to get to a stage where we could. 3D print Have food. like a Star Trek replicator. Yeah, exactly. What, well, what do they call that thing? So if, if you that are thing. printing replicator, food, yeah. though, you actually still got the base nutrients and stuff like that. Exactly. It's the base so, nutrients. So it's kind of getting the primary colors of food type of thing. Yeah, so you still need the filament, effectively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah, but I mean, like, this is... If, if you're wondering about, like, th this is the thing that... that uh, some Well, at least some of the things. I mean, there's, there's a lot of development happening on the mobile front. But in terms of a small thing where, where small fries like us can make big inroads... This is a well, place well, to start. Well, that is exactly the thing. Like one of the things we've realized at House for Hack now is that it um, these well not just three D printers, but three D printers combined with Arduinos and all of the all of the sort of technology that's coming out now, including Android and Raspberry Pi and so on. They enable us to make whatever device we really want to create ourselves, right? Whereas five years ago we couldn't make I couldn't make a blue moat. It's impossible, right? It was just too much work. You need a company. Mm. You need manufacturing skills and so on. And then but you'd now, be running into all sorts of patent issues as well. Exactly. And, and also you have to write all the code uh, from scratch. Yeah. Whereas now you sort of uh, download a module, you plug it in, you download the library, and then all you have to do is wire everything together. And that's how it should be. We should be building on progress. So we've got to a stage now where we can actually start building whatever we want to. And uh, that's kind of what we're trying to do more of at House for Hack is just let's just build the stuff that we want to. And uh, one, some of them could be Kickstarter projects. I mean, Blue Mode, I considered putting it on, on Kickstarter. And then I decided, well, that might be too onerous if it does, you know, sort of even slightly take off. Now I have to go and make all of these Blue Mode. <laughs> so I thought, okay, well, let me take it easy. But it's, it's all part of it, you know, that we can now make whatever we want. Mm. If we want to make a watch that connects to our, our Android phone, we can. You yeah. Know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Who ordered one of those, by the way? Who managed to get one before they <laughs> sold out? <laughs> yep, sorry, we we're, were sorry. all locked out. <laughs> Very sad. I'm, 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 that's that's I'm why passing. I jumped on this Android console one last night. No, as soon I'm, as I saw the thing, I'm like, bye. I'm <laughs> passing on the first gen stuff. I'm I'm like, I'll, I'll, yeah. you know, I'll, after I bought the transformer, yeah. and then <laughs> six months later, it was already a piece of crap because now the Prime is out, and then the Prime HD is out, and then okay, the but, phone but is But there out. was problems with uh, the updated versions of the of the True. transformer. The Prime True. had some GPS and Wi-Fi issues. The Prime Infinity, so far, I think they've fixed most of it. Mm -hmm. But the Pad 300 is looking really good. That's what I'm waiting for. Mm. So that's my next tablet, right? So there. so the second gen Pebble Watch, yeah, I'll probably <laughs> it's gonna be, be awesome. there. Yeah. Nexus Seven, man. I don't have color. For tablet. Yeah, exactly. Nice. I, I waited a bit too long for, for a Kindle color, and I, I couldn't wait any longer, so I ended up buying a well, Kindle Touch. Why would you want a Kindle color, though? 
It just seems graphic like novels. a cool thing to have. Yeah. <laughs> no, but graphic Kindle novels, pictures. magazines. Kindle cover is, is, but it's still not the passive screen. It's not the e ink. The e-ink no, 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 I'm not talking about Kindle Fire. I'm talking about an e ink color, color display. Oh, yeah, yeah no. Yeah, the, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. are there any of those yet? And, no, and the other problem is I've actually, I've actually looked at it's some of the books. Some of the books do have illustrations in them that, that mm. do display, yeah. like maps in the Game of Thrones books, mm. for example. Yep, yep. But I, for example, um, downloaded. Um, uh, books freely available books from the erstwhile limerick writer mm-hmm. Ed, uh, writer Edward Lear, and um, some of the coolest stuff about his books is that they are illustrated, often by him, and none of those illustrations are available in the free versions of the books. Uh, just it just like square brackets illustration. Um, so I think that there are cases in Kindle where there aren't illustrations. So if they're oh. going to launch a Kindle Color, they're uh, going to need to make uh, sure that. I would, I would love to the Kindle Sorry, They I, may I need to look at I, their, their format because the format that they're using for Kindles, it's not EPUB. Um, so there may be some limitations in the format making illustrations difficult. Mm-hmm. No, they, they can actually do it. The, the main problem, because uh, they've got well, the, they can do the it. new version that they've released, which allows the books to be put onto the Kindle Fire, which does the illustrations fine, apparently. Mm. Well, uh, they they can do it. I mean, as with Game of Thrones and other things, maps and pictures. I mean, you can mm. you can do that. And I mean, just from the Kindle screensaver, you can see that obviously pictures are possible. But trying to do that, whether it's easy for publishers to be able to get them in there and format them properly, is yeah, inline uh, pictures and stuff, and yeah. alignment and that sort of thing. Yep. I don't yeah. know about that. Yeah, especially because you can change font sizes and you can wrap stuff. Yep, yeah. yep. And I've I've seen issues even in like uh, development books, code books, um, yeah. you know, those types of things where, you know, in a, in a textbook you have your normal text and then you start having these blocks all over the page. I actually tried with reading Kindle versions you start running into problems with you have just that block on a full page. It's not yeah, formatted s- properly. Sidebars and stuff, it just, you end up having to read the PDF like as is. You can't zoom in and so on. Yeah. And then yeah. you'd rather just read it and on a tablet. Really irritating. The, yeah. the reason why I think they can actually, well, it's, it's more of the Kindle, current Kindle device problems. So if you use the web, web interface, doesn't have any of those problems and there you can also scale on so it's like the markup supports it but there's something up with the devices that doesn't render them correctly or what what imagine you would have to do you actually need the publishers to do a bit of work to to get those images formatted for the kindle i guess but then you've also got the the kindle dx you've got different sizes of kindle devices Mm. to support they probably need better tooling yeah. Fragmentation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One of the guys at House for Hack uh, took a Kindle and sewed it onto a T-shirt, and it points to a little uh, a web server running on his phone, and you know it's got a, a built-in browser. Yeah. So he points the browser at that thing, and then it just refreshes. So it's, it just shows different stuff oh, all cool. the time as it walks around. <laughs> How cool can't, is that? You can't do that with a new one. <laughs> no, oh, it is co- a new one. Does it have a browser? They all do. I think. The, yeah. the Kindle, well, the Kindle keyboard. The problem is with the Kindle Touch. I think the Touch doesn't have. Interesting. Oh, no, wait. It does, but the 3G is not free or something like I'll, that. I'll need to look into You're this. talking about the base Kindle, the $80 Kindle. Uh, no, the Kindle Touch. Interesting. There, no, there, was, there was something funny with one of the models. You're right, but the keyboard does still have a browser, okay. the Kindle keyboard. I, I don't have the... That's the one that I have. I, I have the non-touch, non-keyboard. Yeah, yeah. That's the, the $80 model. Kindle. Yeah. Uh, the, yes. the Senor Cheapo. Yeah. 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 El Cheapo. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I took the audio. It was the audio that that's actually. Uh, that's actually, I think, one of my favorite ones. Because uh, you've got one. buttons. The touch, you got to. Like, yeah, in winter, no. you got to take your hand out of the blanket and you <laughs> press <laughs> the screen. Oh, no, no dice. Terrible. Not going to happen. <laughs> no. All right. Taking us into our kicker, talking about books. Uh, and and an- talking about Game of Thrones, uh, funny enough. Yeah, uh, exactly. Um, so, uh, another Minecraft kicker, but you'll understand that Minecraft is just a treasure trove for these Minecraft things. Minecraft is virtual Lego. I Today, <laughs> I have decided that. and. Minecraft, there's now Minecraft Lego, and I think that's just perfect. We uh, should do more of that. Since we talk about Minecraft, Stu has his. Is you know the uh, m- the game machine that we were talking about earlier? Yes. You know one of the things that we signed on. Minecraft. Well, yes. not not just said yeah. he'll look at he'll Ooh, look yeah. at something. He did tweet something um, that he'll look at something about the platform. And um, well, there's and already all Minecraft of Android. their games. What's yeah, the studio's name? Minecraft or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 All, all of their games, not said, if the if there's enough traction on the platform, they'll port to this thing. Fantastic. So awesome. whatever Notch's studio's name is. Like, I don't remember these things. Get them my gaming guys on for that. <laughs> anyway, so this that brings us to Westeroscraft, which is guys who climbed in Minecraft and uh, made parts of Westeros. So parts from Game of Thrones. And they've published some pictures. I actually found this on Reddit. Yeah, um, yeah well, Imgur. There's an Imgur link. Yeah, Imgur. That'll be in the show notes, and yeah, go uh, check it out. It's some the, the work that they did. Yeah, it's absolutely yeah. gorgeous, and it, and it, it does look like it's inspired by the series. 
um, yes. rather than people's own interpretation of things. Them. Yes. Because I don't imagine Harren Hall like that at all. That's how the series did it. Anyway. Isn't it uh, is this inspired also by the opening um, sequence? Possibly, yeah. And so you'll, one, you'll notice that some of the pictures um, look like they're that using one. different textures as well. So it looks like some of them are done with uh, certain texture packs, maybe some high um, high res texture packs as well. Um, but the amount of time that these guys had to spend making that, I can only imagine. Um, and it's gorgeous. It's awesome. Pretty, pretty More cool. of that. It is winning. Thank you, mm. Minecraft players. Uh, the geeks of the world salute you. Uh, with that, I think that brings us to the end of our show. Um, so, Toby, uh, tell everybody where they can find you online, in real life, well, whatever. I'm quite active on Twitter. Uh, my username, is, my handle is at Toby Kurian, K U R I E N. Um, my website, tobykurian.com, links to all of my other stuff so you can check out what gadgets I've got. And I'm also quite active on Google, but I quite respect other people's timelines, so I don't post a lot. But when I do post, I post cool stuff. So Very check cool. me out. Cool. Yeah. Um, Sorry, with any other projects you wanted to mention or anything you wanted to... Maybe for another show, hey? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. Where can people find you, Gerrit? Uh, About.me slash hawkeyza. That links to... That's about.me forward slash H-A-W-K-I-E-S. That links to pretty much everything on the Interblags where I am active at any point in time. Cool. Tim, where can people find you? Uh, instead of finding me, you can go like all the Let's Talk Geek pages. Uh, I, I'm not so I'm not so active online at the moment. Just uh, way too busy with real day to day life stuff things. Cool. Uh, I'm Jan from Yellen. I write for my broadband, and that's where I spend most of my online time. I do have a Twitter account at Jan VZA, um, and I'm also on Google Plus. Also, don't post much Jan from Yellen, and then you just go and look for my face and pop that in a circle. And, uh, yeah, other than that, uh, go like Let's Talk Geek, uh, Let's Talk Network on Facebook. Circle us. Follow us on Facebook. Uh, Face, yeah, it's going to Facebook us. Yeah, f in, no, don't inbox us. I don't even know how to check the Facebook inbox thing. Um, email us, anything, at ltnet.tv. Uh, if, you if you've got show ideas, people we should get on. Uh, anything like that? Corrections. Corrections, yeah. Uh, that, that has got a very specific email address. It's lol, Jan was wrong again at ltnet.tv. <laughs> <laughs> We're about equal at the moment <laughs> between you and me. <laughs> uh, so with that, thank you very much for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. <laughs>